Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first presentation of this evening. My name is Luc Peus, and I've been a clinical perfusionist for over 19 years. I've worked mainly around the Brussels area, but currently I'm in the process of moving to the United States, where I momentarily reside. I would like to thank EACTA and the organizing committee for inviting a perfusionist to this webinar. I think it is testimony of the importance EACTA attaches to the concept of teamwork during weaning of CPB. My presentation will focus a little bit more on the non-technical skills of weaning of bypass, with an emphasis on the use of a checklist before coming off bypass. So I have no conflict of interest uh, to declare regarding this presentation. I'll be giving a short outline of my uh, presentation and what we will discuss. As I said before, uh, non-technical skills will be the focus, um, of which the checklist is a cognitive A2, assist these skills, but the checklist also needs these skills for its correct execution. I will discuss the pros and cons of a checklist and take a look at what the literature has to say about weaning checklists in particular. Then a short description of a proposed checklist, but more importantly, some tips on how a checklist is best executed and which specific pitfalls and caveats are to be considered. To conclude, some take home, mes home messages to ponder on. As we know, cardiac surgery in itself is a very complex given. It is it is in an environment that can turn very stressful in a matter of seconds. It requires not only technical skills and knowledge, but also experience, the ability to work in a team and under stress, and some other non-technical skills, which I will describe here. Uh, my job, I've always described it as 95% as of my job is to prevent the other 5% from happening. So the weaning phase is a phase in the procedure where these skills come to life to make that happen. It's mostly about preventing bad things to happen. First of all, there is preparation uh, and protocols. Have protocols for certain weaning situations, have pre-operative -op, pre team discussions about the case, be ready for the intervention. That means knowing your patient, knowing all the materials that are ready and so on and so on. Also, a description of the procedure before you do it is, is very handy. Communication is, of course, very important. Teams are advised to adopt to a standardized communication pattern so that team members know what's going on and when they need to listen up. It's also about leadership and daring to speak up. Dare to say that problems are evolving during the case so that they not show up during weaning. It's, it's, of course, sharing of information, but also teamwork and respect for each other's remarks and for the time frame needed to do something about it. Briefing and debriefing skills can lead to uh, respectful case discussions and, it's, and can lead, also lead to installing measures to prevent or deal with given situations. It's also very okay to give compliments once in a while. And without going deeper into it, the concept of safety too is something that is very appealing and that we all can learn from. If you don't know what that means, you can just look it up and uh, use it in your practice. So the checklist regarding non-technical skills. The, check the checklist is a cognitive aid that can be used to assist certain non-technical skills. At the same time, it also requires these skills, these non-technical skills to be e executed properly. And now it is not because we present uh, about a weaning checklist that teams should automatically just adopt them in practice. There's a lot of controversy around checklists. And as with any other intervention, there are upsides and downsides uh, to consider and some serious uh, pitfalls. Let's take a look at the advantages of using a checklist. This is checklist in general. Certain studies have proven that uh, the installment of the WHO surgical safety checklist has led to the prevention of adverse events and has augmented out outcomes. We could say that it is a cognitive aid that reduces our reliance on the human memory 
which, as we all know, can fail. This way, it would reduce errors and have a stick more to best practices. Checklists, make sure that tasks, <coughs> excuse me, checklists make sure that ta tasks are executed more efficiently and they free up space in the brain of the practitioner. Even after a while, when someone knows a checklist will come up later in the, in the intervention, tasks will be executed uh, more on time, making procedures run more smoothly, and the actual performance of the checklist will go faster and more efficient. Now, on the other hand, there are the cons. And um, these would actually refrain people from adopting checklists. Certain studies have found that the introduction of the of the checklist we talked about before, the WA, WHO surgical safety checklist, has not led to the reduction of mortality and adverse events. A major study in a huge number of hospitals in Ontario, Canada, is a well-known example of this. Checklists do not fix a broken organizational structure and they cannot replace the need for more structural needs like teamwork, education, training and simulation. Checklists are often needlessly long and too complex or nonsensical and all this may lead to so-called checklist fatigue. In contrast to what I have said before, they may lead to distracting the practitioner and take away attention of critical moments. And let's face it, gaming the system is universal. We all have that colleague who just checks the boxes and that's it. They may, checklists may give you a false sense of protection. Between brackets, the system will protect the patient and myself. Of what's also important is that uh, caregivers need feedback. People need to know if, action, if using the checklist is actually improving anything. And finally, implementation of checklists takes time. Checklists need to be well designed, tested if they, if they need to be tested to see if they are fit for a specific uh, location, and they need to be educated and trained by the whole team. So there's a lot of things to consider when we when you want to decide to use a checklist. And the effect of introducing a checklist uh, is variable. Sometimes introducing a checklist can be, ben can be beneficial or it can be that there is no measurable effect. And even worse, it can be that there is an adverse effect on team, uh, that there is an adverse effect on team functioning. A lot depends on how the team functioned before introducing the checklist, or maybe the checklist was imposed to the team and the team doesn't want to use it. And of utmost importance is how the checklist is executed. The, the reason for uh, not augmenting um, quality and not uh, reducing adverse events in Ontario, Canada was because the checklist was probably not well executed or not executed at all, and the boxes were just marked. This leads us to the, to the very first question that needs to be asked. Do we actually need a weaning checklist? And with we, I mean the team, the team in a very specific center. Asking this question first might actually solve some of the resistance towards the use of a checklist. So let's say you have done your, your homework, you've done the maths, you say our team is okay, our patients farewell, and we think we don't need a checklist. Well, then congratulations, you're doing a great job and, and keep up the good work. But you have to be honest about yourself and uh, you have to be honest to your patients and you really have to know if when you are weaning a patient, do you not miss some uh, items that need to be checked? Or maybe the reason for saying, no, we don't need this checklist is because you're waiting for the right opportunity to introduce it. Maybe you realize that your team is not going to accept it or there are some people who might uh, not be willing to, to accept it. On the other hand, when you feel that your team says yes, your, your team's performance and your patient's outcomes might benefit from a checklist, then it is advisable to do really good research on it. 
develop and test uh, to see if it fits your practice. You can introduce the, the checklist and look at, uh, consider all the caveats that you need to do, but also train, educate, and eval evaluate the effect of the checklist. And whatever you do, always do it as a team. It's very important. Teamwork is very important when using a checklist. And I will say, uh, I've said it before, and I will probably say it a few more times again. <clears throat> so when you're ready to introduce a checklist, uh, it's obviously uh, important to read the literature on checklists in general. There's a lot of there's lots of good examples, even for weaning scenarios. And some organizations have tutorials on uh, on what makes a good checklist. Checklists can uh, eventually be accompanied or enhanced when they are supported by briefings, or checklists can even be looked at as small briefings. All this can create can lead to the creation of a so-called shared mental model. I'm not going to go deeper into this uh, into this concept, but I just wanted to mention it here uh, in this presentation. It, it means that you all go, of course, to the to the same direction, that everybody knows where, where the team is going to. And lastly, you must always keep in mind that che checklists are only one of the many actions that are needed in, in the whole scheme of uh, quality improvement. So what does the, the literature offer us on weaning checklists? <clears throat> We can find many, many manuscripts, even whole books on checklists in general. And there are some articles on weaning uh, that offer a list of items to be looked at. And some even call it a checklist. And of course, they are all more or less the same. Like everybody knows that a ventilator needs to be on uh, when you go of bypass. And everybody knows that the heart rhythm must be stable. So they are more or less the same. Um, the problem is that there is no literature on the research uh, on the effect of the clinical implementation. And some argue even that it might never be proven uh, that a checklist will be beneficial for your patients and for the team uh, function. There were some recent guidelines produced uh, by EX, EACTA and EBCP. And they have a recommendation on the use of a checklist and a proposal of a checklist. We will we'll go later uh, go into that. But of course, many checklists are the same, but they should all be adapted. They, the one that you want to use should be adapted to fit your specific local needs. There is one interesting research article that I would like to discuss. And this article from 2014 uh, describes a process where they develop uh, a checklist using a, a modified Delphi uh, process. But most importantly and more interestingly is that they uh, looked at the effect of introducing the checklist. This was in a, in a simulation scenario, but was, it was nevertheless interesting. There were f uh, 10 residents and they all performed in four different scenarios. Each scenario was first performed without a checklist and later again with the use of a checklist. And little surprisingly, when they were using a checklist, there was of course lesser uh, omissions of tasks than, than when they had to rely on memory alone. This seems obvious when you can use a written checklist, uh, but there were still some surprising facts to discover. So their conclusion was that uh, the, the use of the checklist during the simulation resulted in an increased uh, number of completed design designated tasks com in comparison to when they had to rely on memory alone. And so checklists may reduce the omission of errors during complex periods of anesthesiologist preoperative workflow. Now, what is notable is that if we look at um, these are the this is the list with all the uh, items that they needed to to uh, look look at that they needed to remember or read from the checklist and 
these are the occurrences, the frequency of the occurrences of uh, items uh, actually uh, actually uh, that they called out the items. And it's very surprisingly that even if they had a checklist, there was only one item that they <coughs> excuse me, there was only one item that they actually everyone called out. You have to notice that it's not because they were not called out that they were not checked, but that is that is a different uh, a different uh, research. So even when using a checklist, not not uh, all uh, uh, items on the checklist were called out, and it's very um, surprising as well that the normothermia uh, item on the checklist was only checked in thirty percent. Of, uh, of 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 uh, weaning procedures procedures based on memory, and only in sixty percent of the of the cases when they had a checklist. So probably they just assumed, okay, the patient is warm. I don't need to uh, call this item. And one of another uh, a last uh, remark is that the the use of a ventilator was even missed more. When the uh, checklist was uh, when they were able to use a checklist, so it's very surprising uh, all of that. So even if you have a checklist, it's very important how you run it, how you execute it. Okay. We go on to the to the recent recently published guidelines on cardiopulmonary bypass. Um, there was a whole chapter eight, which is completely uh, devoted to the separation of bypass, and there is a, the weaning checklist is mentioned. There is one recommendation, and that is a class one level C recommendation, so that the, it is recommended to use a checklist before the weaning process to enhance team performance and augment patient safety. This is a class one because we we believed or the the. The committee believed that it that it's important to use it and it can work. A checklist has proven to be better if it's executed well, but of course there is no uh, no evidence to prove this. <coughs> this was a consensus consensus decision. So what we also did is that we uh, proposed a checklist uh, to be used uh, with with items here uh, seen on, on, on this list. Uh, this is only a proposal. Of course, everyone should adapt this uh, checklist to their local needs. We especially did not uh, use any values uh, for, for example, uh, um, uh, reperfusion time. There is no recommendation on how long it must take. Also on the temperature, uh, nobody can tell you what temperature the, the patient actually needs to be coming of bypass and the same for hematocrit hemoglobin, hemoglobin and uh, ionogram uh, values. The layout and the order of the items is very important. Uh, it's a very difficult process to have the right order in, in uh, items, uh, but it's also uh, the, the most difficult task. Okay. One item that is that is very important is that agreement by every team member that the patient can be weaned from bypass is another uh, emphasis on teamwork, another advocate on teamwork. When, so let's say you have created the checklist, everyone agrees, agrees on the design and it should be used. Now what? When executing the checklist, there's a few things to reconsider. To be considered. Although it's a team effort, it is best that there is one lead that uh, calls out the items and crosses off the checkboxes. We leave it to the team this dynamics to whom this should be. Uh, doing a checklist requires a timeout. Everyone should be silent except for the, the, the persons uh, that are calling out the items and the persons responding to those items. This way you can make a short, concise and a very clear checklist. And the more you do this checklist, the easier it gets and the, the better the flow of the work. As I said, consider the order of the items as it has to make sense. Also allow people to speak up. It's a form of respect. 
and the concept of a timeout allows for this. All, of course, call out and check all boxes. I've said that be, uh, before. And uh, allow, and that's another uh, sign of respect, allow for action to be taken. I'm almost at the end of the presentation. Just a few uh, things to consider for the future. Our technology allows uh, more and more communication between machines, and this has led to some uh, some new publications. This is a very basic uh, heart-lung machine communication with a ventilator. And it simply says, if your flow is zero and the respiratory rate of your ventilator is zero, then an alarm will pop up. So it's very rudimentary, but it's a start of uh, machines uh, telling us how to wean a patient from from uh, bypass or telling us that something is going wrong. Same here, uh, this is a new generation heart lung machine and when something happens it will pop up a checklist to uh, tell you something like something is going wrong, check this, check this, check this, check this. And the same machine also has uh, apps it works it runs on apps and it even has a patient weaning uh, protocol where it uh, controls the the clamps on the venous line and the flow uh, the flow rate so to conclude um, some take-home messages uh, the first and most important question is do we really need a weaning checklist and if so do your research do take very much time to develop and test it and educate and train and evaluate it and most importantly do it as a team i would like to thank you for your uh, attention